Hello, class. Welcome to um, week seven and lecture six for REL 131, um, Christian Doctrine for the Summer Quarter 2023 on August the 17th. Um, so we are um, nearing the end of class. Um, as you know, we had the midterm tests a couple weeks ago. Um, now, I know a few of you maybe didn't take the tests. Um, if you did not, please contact me as soon as possible and make arrangements. Uh, the test is important, and I don't think you can get a passing grade in the class without taking it. So please contact me to make arrangements if you still need to take the test. Uh, also want to remind you that uh, uh, of, of all the assignments for the previous weeks, uh, please be sure you've submitted them to me. I'll still accept them, the ones you have not submitted from previous weeks. Also keep in mind the um, term paper that's due the 10th week. Um, the earlier you get that done, the better. Um, if you want to go ahead and send it earlier than the 10th week, that's fine. Uh, just to save yourself the stress of everything piling up on you the 10th week, having to do the paper as well as the final exam. Um, if you have any questions about anything, including the paper or any of the other assignments, please let me know. I'm catching up on the emails um, and should respond to um, any recent emails you've sent the last few days, I should complete those by the this weekend. I'm also still grading the tests. So if you want to know your grade, let me know. I uh, will try to have those tests graded within the next week or so as well. Um, anyways, this is our um, seventh class, so our sixth lecture. Uh, keep in mind after the midterm that the... Um, in the notes, I've said the lecture number, but that's also that's um one the, the class number is one more than the lecture number. So this is the seventh class. So there's two more lectures after this um, next two weeks, and then in three weeks will be the uh, final exam. And once again, you'll need to come to campus to take the final exam, or if for some reason you cannot, please contact me to make arrangements, and I'll try to work that out with the school uh, just to be sure that you can complete the exam and. Um, get a passing grade in the course. Okay, so that all being said, let's um, proceed with the lesson for today. So I've called this, uh, again, lecture six. Um, but it is actually um, the seventh week of the class, and we are continuing the first part of class with the topic of soteriology that we began last week, and we're continuing with chapter seven from um, Jones's book. We didn't quite finish that last week. Um, we got maybe halfway, so we'll continue and finish this one today. So we're on the uh, topic of the way of salvation. Um, last week, lecture five, we discussed the first two parts of this topic, which are uh, number one, the beginnings of salvation, and number two, justification. So you can review um, the lecture from last week if you if you need to review um, those topics. But we'll pick up today with the third part, which is sanctification. Uh, so we'll start with the pardoned criminal is released. Um, this is an image of um, our justification uh, being freed from uh, prison. Um, an old hymn or a worship song um, describes our salvation with the image of our chains falling off and our hearts being set free so we can rise and follow Jesus, the one who saved us. The justified sinner moves into the life of discipleship following the righteous Christ. Justification passes into sanctification. Um, so justify again. Keep in mind, it's like just as if I had not sinned, um, my sin is being forgiven. Um, I'm being made new, or, or uh, I have a new status of forgiveness. But sanctify, uh, that's the same word where we, we get the word saint. If we think about uh, someone who lives a holy life, so being made a saint, a holy person, that's the process of sanctification. So sanctification is God's work in us, making us, or God's work in making us godly, holy, and like Christ. Like each other step on the way of salvation, sanctification is a gift of grace. 
God declares us righteous because of what Christ has done for us, and God transforms us in righteousness as we grow in Christ. In highlighting the truth that salvation is by grace and not by works, Protestant soteriology tends to maintain a pause between justification and sanctification, between God's work in forgiving our sin, declaring us righteous, and God's work uh, in transforming us into new creatures, uh, making us actually holy. So declaring us holy or declaring us righteous versus make, actually making us righteous or holy. Um, so the pause highlights the gracious truth that justification is not based on sanctification, but on Christ alone. And the conceptual difference between justification and sanctification helps us to keep this straight. In other words, providing a safeguard against any tendency to believe that God will justify us only if we perform well. And again, this pause that we're talking about, um, it keeps these two categories distinct, but they do um, work together. There's not so much of a time lapse as it is we want to just understand the two terms separately. Um, they do happen, um, the process all happens kind of at the same time um, or begins with justification and continues with sanctification, but um, that does not mean there's a huge time division. It's, it's uh, more a matter of we have to separate them for understanding purposes and make sure we've got straight this idea that we are saved by grace. Um, all right, so Christian, let's see. Christian soteriology must follow the teaching of Scripture in rejecting errors on two sides of the truth. The teaching of justification by faith stands against the error of legalism or works righteousness that is against a hopeless Pelagianism in which we attempt to be our own saviors or earn our salvation. So on the other side, the doctrine of sanctification stands against the error of antinomianism, of acting as if God's law had nothing to say to the Christian life, as if it didn't matter how we live. Justification leads into sanctification. When God forgives us, he also leads us into the ways of righteousness. The reality of justification by faith does not diminish the reality of abundant fruit or holy living, um, but in fact produces such fruit, um, as we'll see um, maybe more so the next chapter. The image of trees and fruit is also helpful in another way. Um, so we are like trees that grow fruit. That's the image, the metaphor that is used in the Bible. Like fruits that grow and ripen over time, sanctification is an ongoing reality of, in the Christian life. Um, after justification, we as God's people continue to grow throughout our lives in the way of grace and holiness. Although a few branches of the Christian tradition teach that sanctification can happen in an instant, the vast majority of Christians see sanctification as a process that fills the entire Christian life. Different branches of the Christian tradition also have various understandings of how far the process of sanctification may go in this life, some being more pessimistic and others more optimistic about how much transformation and holiness can happen during our, during our earthly lives. This is a lively debate, but it should not obscure the center reality of Christian faith. So these branches of the tradition are attached to the same trunk, namely Christ, um, in whom we know that justification and sanctification cannot be split apart. There is wide Christian unity in the truth that, first, we have no power, without the righteousness of Christ, and second, faith without works is dead. We are made more and more like Christ in, um, as our relationships with him deepen, as we learn to know and love him better, and as we partake of the means of grace God offers us as helps for our sanctification, um, such as reading the scriptures, prayer, the Lord's Supper, Christian fellowship, singleness and marriage, caring for the poor, service, Fasting, pursuing justice, and many more. 
God uses such means to make us holy, to transform us into more faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. And now we look at final redemption number four. The way of salvation does not end with this life. Sanctification passes into everlasting life. Uh, Paul teaches us to confidently affirm that God, who began a good work in us, will bring it to completion. God's final good intention for us, um, the fulfillment of his saving work, involves much more than our going to heaven when we die. The whole biblical picture shows a saving God who will bring all things to completion in individuals, in the church, and in all of creation, bringing wholeness and holiness. Final redemption is God's final victory over sin and death. It is restored and intimate friendship with God. Okay, let's look at dynamic of grace and human freedom. Given that salvation is by grace, given that we are broken sinners in need of rescue, how do we understand the agency of human beings in the process of salvation? Um, within Protestantism, there are varying answers to this question. The conversation is usually framed as a debate between Calvinist and Arminian schools of theology, though this is an oversimplification. And if you're familiar with different kinds of churches, uh, the Presbyterian and Reformed type of churches, to go back to the early Protestant Reformation, those are uh, follow the teaching of John Calvin, so they're known as Calvinist. Um, Arminian schools of theology, Arminius was a the, um, theologian, as we'll see, that modified Calvinist teaching, and um, his idea became um, accepted more strongly in the first the Methodist Church and various branches of the Methodist Church. Um, and we see that probably more so, in, or it seems more dominant in the Pentecostal and charismatic type churches today, and uh, certain other churches, maybe the Church of Christ tradition. Uh, Baptist churches can go either way, so they're split. Uh, you have um, within the Baptist churches, some people are more Calvinist, some are more Arminian, but uh, especially Presbyterian slash Reformed and um, Methodist or the Holiness types of churches are the um, the more dominant churches you see this division in. So the again, this is an oversimplification. Um, the Calvinist understanding of salvation focuses on the priority and sovereignty of God's grace by emphasizing God as the sole agent of salvation. The Arminian understanding focuses on God's loving desire to be in saving relationship with humanity and connects this to God's opening up space for human agency alongside divine grace and salvation. Both sides have emphases worth appreciating. Calvinist and Arminian views of salvation share a starting point, the Protestant doctrine of justification by grace. Both traditions confess that all humanity bears the weight of sin, all human beings are fallen, and we are incapable of saving ourselves. We are bound by sin and need rescue. We depend on the saving grace of Jesus Christ, not only because we sin as individuals, but because human nature is fallen. So from this shared understanding, the Calvinist and Arminian traditions emphasize different concerns. First is Arminianism. Classic Arminian theology takes its name from the Dutch theologian Jacobus Arminius, who lived from 1560 to 1609, who affirmed that prevenient grace, uh, that's a term for a gift of grace from God that comes before us, preceding anything we do, and that this is available for all people, or this is for all people, not only for the elect. The elect is means chosen, um, and it means those who are ultimately saved. Uh, Arminius believed that prevenient grace is made available through the saving work of Christ and enables sinners to respond to God if they do not resist the grace. In 1610, after the death of Arminius, five 
uh, remonstrant articles were written by a group of like-minded Christians or probably followers of Arminius. Um, each article invokes the grace of God in all aspects of salvation. The article states, number one, God's will is, is to elect those who, through his grace, believe in Jesus and persevere in faith. Number two, Christ died for all humanity, which emphasizes God's love for the whole world. Number three, humans cannot obtain saving faith by themselves and need God's grace through Christ to be renewed in thought and will. Number four, grace is the cause of the beginning, progress, and completion of salvation. And this grace works with human freedom, uh, meaning humans can either cooperate with it or resist it. And number five, in Christ, humans receive the strength of the Spirit to fight and gain victory over sin and Satan. Uh, and yet apostasy, which means turning away from God and falling away from saving faith, uh, this still remains a possibility. Arminianism may be known popularly as a theology of human free will, but its emphases are more truly on the universal love of a gracious God who reaches out to all in love, wanting to free sinners and be in authentic relationship with them. So just to summarize, um, God wants to save everyone. Jesus died for everyone. Uh, God offers the gift of grace to everyone, uh, but we can either accept it or reject it. We have free will. We can accept it or reject it. So God has um, chosen to save those whom he foreknew from before the beginning of time. God had foreknowledge of who would accept and who would reject. So God chose those who, accept, who he knew were going to accept or who, in his um, sense of time, the sense of time is the same, so for him, they've already accepted it, and he chose them. So that's Arminianism. Let's move on to number two, Calvinism. Um, the soteriology known as five-point Calvinism was a response to Arminianism articulated at the Synod of Dort, 1618 through 1619. So uh, this follows the teaching of John Calvin or seeks to interpret the teaching of John Calvin um, or to carry on um, some of the things that he taught in terms of predestination, especially. But uh, officially, this uh, these five points developed after the time of Calvin and were a response to Arminius. Um, so the five points are often summarized with the acronym TULIP. Um, in which the letters stand for the following points. Number one, it's total depravity, which um, focuses on original sin. All are sinners and unable to choose God or save ourselves. Number two, unconditional election. God chooses some according to his will without regard to their foreseen faith. Election is not based on any condition that might be met by human beings, but solely based on God's will. Number three is limited atonement. The atoning work of Christ is effective only for the elect and does not apply to those who remain in sin. Number four is irresistible grace. The electing grace of God will not fail and cannot be resisted. And number five, perseverance of the saints. God will finish his saving work in the elect. Thus, the elect cannot fall away from their faith and their salvation. Uh, so Calvinism may be known popularly as a theology of deterministic providence, but its emphases are more truly on the magnificent sovereignty of grace, the only hope for bound sinners who cannot free themselves. So let me summarize this view again. Uh, in this view, uh, God is in control. God is sovereign. And God chooses those who will be saved. Um, at the more extreme, that also means God chooses who is not saved. But some Calvinists um, don't specify that point. They only specify the first one, that God chooses who is saved. It's not based on that he foreknows who's going to accept him and reject him. But it's his choice um, to save who he wants to save. But we, all, uh, we do all know that not everyone will be saved, so that means that 
Um, ultimately, there are some that God has not chosen. Uh, and uh, God shows grace to those he will. In this case, or in this view, his grace is irresistible. People do not have the freedom to resist his grace. But if he gives grace, it essentially changes them or shapes them um, and makes them decide to have faith uh, in him. And then ultimately, Jesus did not die for um, the whole world, for everyone, but his death is only for those who who um, God calls and chooses and those who who do come to faith because of God has um, chosen them. So there are definitely differences between the views. Um, you can think about which one you prefer. Um, I can't help but prefer the Arminian view between these two. Uh, so hopefully I've not made, uh, made my bias affect the way I've uh, described these, but um, that is the way that I see it. Uh, I think there is more room for free will and that God is fair and um, offering his grace to all people. So despite the initial shared teaching between Calvinism and Arminianism, these are two different soteriologies, both of which struggle to be faithful to biblical teaching. Calvinist theology is monergistic, meaning that God is the only actor in salvation. Arminian theology is synergistic, meaning that God works together with human beings in the process of salvation. Uh, Calvinist soteriology locates the basis for election and God's sovereign will. Arminian soteriology locates that basis in God's foreknowledge of those who will believe in Christ. All right, let's look at this term by grace. Well, Calvinism and Arminianism both recognize human depravity, and while both are theologies of grace, it is unfortunately the case that many of us still live our daily lives in de facto Pelagianism, meaning whether we would declare it or not, uh, we are in fact practicing, or at some level we hold on to this these Pelagian ideas. Uh, we're trying and failing to justify ourselves based on our own righteousness. Pelagius taught that we are capable of journey, turning to God in love. Against Pelagianism, Augustine insisted that we are bound by sin and stand in need of the saving grace of Christ, um, the only one who is righteous to save. So we fall into Pelagian patterns when we fear that we are not saved because our religious feelings have weakened or because of our repeated failures, and our solution is to try harder. Our habit of Pelagianism may be part of human nature under sin, but it is also tied to historical realities behind present-day North American faith, um, so such as the teaching of the popular preacher Charles Finney um, during the time of the Second Great Awakening, uh, and he taught that turning to God is the sinner's own act. So that uh, goes beyond the free will view of Arminianism to the more um, self-salvation view of Pelagianism. He was not quite right in teaching that. Uh, further, in the American context, we value independence and the narrative of the self-made individual. Uh, for these reasons, we may need special practice in the doctrine of soteriology to help us unlearn the habit of works righteousness and trust instead in the God of grace. So it'd be interesting to uh, learn more, maybe from even some of you that are from um, international context and uh, see how your specific um, cultural context or um, values would uh, will shape your theology in this regard. So this is the way that, or the, the drawback of um, the, uh, the values of American culture of independence and uh, um, we would say individualism or the idea that you can make yourself, that this does tend to shape us theologically toward Pelagian views and practices. Uh, both Calvinist and Arminian soteriology flowing from the broad Augustinian and more narrow Protestant streams of Christian faith, teach our total need for grace. Calvinism does this in viewing grace as irresistible and unconditional. 
Arminianism in viewing grace as free and universal and in highlighting the category of prevenient grace. Both strands of thought contain resources for helping us unlearn our Pelagianism. Let's turn now to the models of atonement. We have looked at soteriology in terms of biblical themes, movements on the way to salvation, and Calvinist and Arminian traditions. We will now turn to theories about how the work of Christ brings about atonement. The word atonement, if you break it up, you can make, um, you can see these three parts. At one meant, um, this was coined to describe the way Christ's work bridges the separation between humans and God, opening the possibility that we may again be reconciled to or made one with God. Each model of atonement has strengths and weaknesses as it attempts faithful speech about the work of Christ. The first view is deification. The first model for understanding atonement emphasizes connections between the incarnation and the whole of humanity. The idea of deification is summarized by Athanasius. This was an early church theologian. I think we've talked about him before. Um, he was a definite opponent of um, Arianism, and he was a key figure at the Council of Nicaea. Um, so he described, oh, he's also, I think, the, um, probably the first one that chose the um, list of 27 books that we now include in the New Testament. Um, not that the others weren't accepting those books before, but he was the first one that made it official and had those exact list of books. Others had maybe slightly different lists. Um, so he describes Christ becoming human so that we might become God. Uh, this is a startling statement, or shocking even, thought that humans might, humans are going to become God. Um, and Athanasius um, recognizes this, but he still does affirm the difference between the creator and creation. Um, but yet he's part of a theological tradition that is willing to speak of human transformation in strong terms, seeing the work of Christ as drawing us into the very life of God. So it's not quite the same as maybe what other religions might teach that are more pantheistic um, or quite the same as what the Mormon church teaches in all of us becoming little gods one day where we rule our own planets, but we are so united to God um, while still having our own individual distinctions, but we are uh, granted God's nature in a sense that um, God lives in us in, this, in that sense Maybe it's better to say we become divine or we share God's divine nature. Uh, so deification is usually identified as the soteriological tradition of Eastern Orthodoxy. The model's strengths are in taking the cosmic nature of salvation seriously and dealing with the biblical witness to real transformation as the end of human salvation and being based in the person of Jesus, meaning both his humanity and divinity, critics of the deification model feared that it violates the distinction between creator and creature, so making us and God the same. Uh, another drawback is that Christ's work in the cross and resurrection takes a secondary place to the incarnation itself. So they look at all of Christ's life, which is um, good to keep in mind, but kind of loses some of the, the main focus on uh, Christ's death on the cross, which he dies for sins. So overall, deification is, we could say, more like poetry. It's an imaginative expression or a way just to describe things imaginatively um, than logic. It is not carefully reasoned theological reflection. Uh, it's not making um, arguments using... Um, logic and um, making points, theological points and things like that. It is just expressing um, this imaginative, poetic type of, of view of, um, of us being united to God. 
and partaking his uh, divine nature. So the second view is Christus Victor. It has been argued that the early church conceptualized atonement in terms of Christ's cosmic victory over sin and death. This dramatic model of atonement focuses on Christ the victor. In Latin, that's Christus Victor. Um, its central theme is the idea of the atonement as a divine conflict and victory. Christ fights against and triumphs over the evil powers of the world, uh, the tyrants under which mankind is in bondage and suffering. And of course, chief, um, this is chiefly Satan, uh, God's enemy, and the one who holds humankind hostage in, uh, in sin and in a kind of slavery. Um, so in him, in Christ, God reconciles the world to himself. A great strength of this model is that it takes death and not sin alone, seriously, as an enemy who's defeated in Jesus, uh, maybe more so in Jesus' resurrection from the dead than in his death. He dies to take the penalty of death, but then he rises again to defeat death. And so this means the model takes resurrection seriously as well. Theologians disagree about whether the role given to Satan is a strength or a weakness of the model. So this almost in some cases makes it sound like uh, when Jesus dies, he's his death is a payment to Satan for uh, the ransom of humanity. Um, but the other views make it more uh, as he is uh, his death is a payment to God for the, for the price of sin uh, to satisfy God's satisfaction and wrath against sin or to satisfy the punishment. So now we'll move on to those views that which are described in number three here. Um, Cross-centered models, satisfaction, forensic, and substitutionary atonement. The next category for atonement models is most often identified with the medieval theologian Anselm of Canterbury and his answer to a key question, why did God become human? Or why did God man, if you take his the title of his book literally, uh, Anselm sees the person of Jesus Christ as God's uniquely fitting response to sin. He uses a metaphor for sin that fits his context, the debt of honor owed to the feudal Lord. We owe God, that should be full honor, and our debt is so large that it is impossible for us to satisfy it. We are limited humans, and we owe God unlimited honor. Um, so only God has the power to do something so immense, yet and Anselm argues justice requires that humans pay the debt, which belongs to humans. If God were to erase the debt without payment, then God would cease to be either just or faithful. Uh, he would have um, neglected the need for justice. Um, so this is the logic behind the gift of the Incarnation. Only Jesus, fully God and fully human, is both able to pay the debt owed for sin and able to meet justice by paying the debt as a human. Other Christian thinkers emphasized Christ's role here as a substitute for us, taking our place to pay the price of sin. For Anselm, God's salvation is both just and merciful. Justice is seen in the fact that God responds to sin. Uh, I duplicated that. God responds to sin with the punishment it deserves, mercy and God's willingness to become human in order to pay sin's just price. Anselm's satisfaction theory of the atonement and theories that focus on Jesus' substitutionary sacrifice fit into the same conceptual space as forensic models, which shift the feudal context to the court of law in terms of the illustration. Uh, whatever the metaphor, the cross-centered model is the dominant model of atonement in Western Christianity, both Protestant and Catholic. The model has many strengths, including being based in the person of Jesus Christ, 
uh, both his humanity and divinity, uh, taking seriously the biblical teaching about justification, dealing seriously with the horror of sin, that sin has consequences, emphasizing the justice and faithfulness of God, and dealing with the central place, Christ's substitutionary sacrifice on the cross takes in the biblical narrative. Drawbacks include giving relatively less attention to the incarnation, life, and resurrection of Christ in comparison to the cross, tending to a soteriology based on individuals at the expense of the communal and cosmic aspects of salvation and focusing on justification at the expense of sanctification. Now we turn to number four, the um, moral exemplar model, uh, moral exemplar model, rather. The final model of atonement is linked with its proponent, Peter Abelard, who lived from 1079 to 1142, around the same time as Anselm, uh, maybe a little afterward, I forget the exact years, but uh, Abelard uh, talks about atonement in terms of the perfect love of Christ, uh, which becomes a moral example for us who are witnesses of that love. Abelard suggests that in seeing the love of Christ, especially on the cross, we are moved by that love to love in turn. So thus the, rem thus the remedy for sin is moral transformation. If taken alone, this moral exemplar view is the weakest of our models, having actually too much in common with Pelagian heresy and moralism to serve as a basis for reconciliation between humanity and God. But if combined with one of the other atonement models that interprets the human situation as standing in need of Jesus as the Savior, then the emphasis on being transformed by Christ's love can take its place in the practice of sociology. So this does um, connect a little better to sanctification, but it doesn't really explain the importance of Christ's death as well for justification. Uh, so we need, need to combine that. We can combine to some extent all the different views or multiple views, if not all of them. Uh, but there are uh, ways that they fit together, that some fit together better than others, or some maybe may need to be modified to uh, to fit with others. So those are the major views of um, uh, Jesus' atonement, what, what it means, uh, what Jesus achieved for us when he died on the cross, and uh, what his life means in terms of saving us or how he saves us. So now we can turn to soteriology and the practices of baptism and communion. It is no accident that the most central and ecumenical practices of Christian faith are practices that represent salvation. Baptism and communion, the sacred practices or sacraments um, recognized by the whole church, are commanded by Jesus in Scripture and have been nearly universally practiced by Christians throughout the history of the faith. Sacraments are formative and communal practices, often defined as outward signs of inward grace, um, comparable to the the incarnation in which Jesus takes on visible flesh um, and the invisible God is seen among us through him. So in baptism, the visible sign is water and communion, it is bread and wine. Both represent Christ's saving work and the visible signs resonate with that work. Okay, I think it's time for a quick break. We'll continue the lecture shortly.